began talking last week in a, a short three-week series. We began talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, especially thinking like we're coming up to Pentecost Sunday next Sunday, uh, which is, as many of you will know, but if you don't, it's, it's the Sunday where we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is told about in Acts chapter 2. And it's, the, it's kind of a, a change that, that God had from the, the Spirit, God's Spirit being made available to special people at special times. I mean, when Jesus came, he talked about how the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Uh, we talk about how by the Spirit of the Lord, David danced uh, be, before the Lord. And, and so the Spirit came at certain times upon certain people uh, for the leadership in worship and the leadership of the nation, the people of Israel. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh, upon all people, uh, upon all who call upon the name of the Lord. And so we wanted to, I wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit for a few weeks as we lead up to Pentecost next week, and especially the, the, the special celebration we'll have with our uh, seven professions of faith and, uh, and one who hasn't been baptized before who will also be baptized uh, at the same time. But the Holy Spirit, right, we, last week we talked about, and maybe you can relate to this, the Holy Spirit tends to be uh, experienced or thought of or seen as, as kind of the mysterious one, <laughs> the mysterious part of the Trinity. God the Father, okay, that's a very solid image. I understand God the Father, Jesus. We have the four Gospels telling the life story and the ministry of Jesus. That's also very concrete and, you know, in history. The Holy Spirit is kind of nebulous sometimes it's the way we, we think of it jesus even talks about people born of the spirit being like the wind and the spirit is it's the same word in greek and hebrew for wind and breath and spirit so the holy spirit is seen in this kind of nebulous kind of way but really simply put as we talked about last week the holy spirit is the living active presence of god the living active presence of god the father of God the Son, in your heart, in my heart, in our lives, in our world. And that's what we talked about last week. So we talked about uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit last week. This week we're going to talk about the people of the Spirit. And next week we'll talk about the power of the Spirit. But again, as, as I, I think I might have ended with last week, talked about the idea that however you experience the Holy Spirit, whether you experience the Holy Spirit in that hour of silence that Bert was talking about, you know, on a retreat, you get out into nature, it's quiet, it's silent, and you're just, oh. Might be a sunset, might be the, the glow of a fire, might be just the, the incredible blooms on, on the trees uh, these days, the smell as you walk underneath it. Like, these things can all make us aware that, oh, God is here, and just kind of have that moment of, of realization God is here that's the spirit it's quiet some of us though sometimes we can be on the other end of the spectrum we can experience the spirit in just powerful ways okay you know in church worship and some traditions very much go this way which is great but you know they're up they're dancing they're moving they're you know the 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 term holy roller uh, was, was, was coined about people who experience the Spirit in this way. Um, because maybe they're, they're even kind of falling down in the Spirit, slain in the Spirit. It's a bit of a derogatory, I don't, don't use that term, it's a bit of a derogatory term, but I just use it to kind of say, like, we experience it in different ways, and I think that's great. You experience the Spirit in powerful ways, you want to get up, you want, you, want to, you want to dance, you want to sing, you just you feel the Spirit in such a strong way. But so whether we're here or whether we're here or whether we're somewhere in here, we want to experience the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is the living, active presence of God. So that's what we talked about last week, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. <coughs> this week... Now we'll move into talking about what does it mean to be the people of the Spirit? Okay, because if, if we are, uh, by our faith in Jesus, those of us who would profess a faith in Jesus, if that means that we have access to or, you know, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, what does it mean to be the people individually, to be a person of the Spirit? 
as well as to be the people, collectively, of the Spirit. What does that look like? What does that mean? And so we're going to look at, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and then a little later, Galatians 5, a couple of verses from there. Um, We actually read this, I don't know how many weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, uh, three, four weeks ago, when we were talking about the idea of calling. And, uh, but we're going to come back to it again today. If, like, if it sounds familiar, like, I think we just read this. Yes, we did. And uh, don't worry, I'm not repeating the same sermon, just the same passage. We're going to dive in a bit more deeply to the first six verses of that passage. We read a longer passage that day. Um, but we're going to revisit uh, those verses and go deeper. Okay? But before I do, and I would invite you to, you can turn in your Red Pew Bibles to Ephesians 4 and read along. But before I do that, let's take a moment and pray. Loving God, you are good. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, help us to recognize your presence. Lord, often the way I pray is I say, we invite you here, we come Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to remember that I think I'm praying that backwards. That Lord, as we gather here, help us to recognize that you are here and that you have invited us. You invite us into your presence, into this holy dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, relationship, and and giving glory and honor uh, to you and one another. And Lord, your Holy Spirit makes that possible. We are invited into this, this holy dance. So Lord, open our eyes to see you here today. Open our ears to hear your word spoken to us. Open our minds and our hearts to receive and respond to whatever it is that you have for us today. And we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So again, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. The Apostle Paul writes, As a prisoner for for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. So I just want to dig in to the passage a little bit today. You know, I love to do that. So I just want to look at some of the words. What, what is it really saying? I think we have a general sense of what it's saying. We understand the words, but let's dig in. Okay? So if you, were, if you were here a few weeks ago when we looked at this passage, remember, it was when we were talking about God's call uh, upon our lives. We talked about the, the universal call. Uh, that we all have, that God gives to all believers, and then the unique call. This portion of the the, the passage was about that universal call, the call that comes to all of us, okay? And the sense of calling is so strong that the word parakaleo, which means to call, to call alongside, is actually used three times. In English, it's only translated as call once, but it's actually there three times in this first verse, okay? So that aspect is very strong. We are called This is our universal calling. This is a calling from God, okay? So what that helps us understand right up front is that this isn't just our own thoughts or our our own ideas, okay? We understand that God has some thoughts and ideas about what our lives should look like, what he calls us uh, to live as, who he calls us to be. So we're we're not just making it up as we go. We are called. And in responding to this, we are responding to God's call. It's part of his plan, okay? So it says, I urge you, I call you uh, to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I urge you to live a life worthy. Living a life here literally means to walk. We talk about our Christian walk or, you know, life is a highway, it's a journey, this language, this, this imagery has been around since at least biblical times. I urge you to, he says, I, I call you to walk, to live in a way that is worthy. Now this word worthy, 
I dug into this word, and, and you know what, what the root meaning of this word is? It means heavy. It means weighty, right? It means something that has substance. It has weight. It, it has substance. So someone who is worthy in this sense, it's like when you bump up against that person, you're like, whew, have you been working out? Like, wow, solid, okay? Solid. I mean, I'm, I'm a sports fan, and if my sports analogies are not helpful to you, please just tune out for the next moment or two. Um, but these are the things that come into my mind when, when I hear this, this idea of solid. I think of, oh, I'm going to talk about hockey for a moment. I'm sorry to all of the Leafs fans who are still grieving. But it's the idea, right, of, of this, this person, this, this guy, this hockey player, who, can just, who gets out on the ice, and he can stand in front of the net. And it's like no one's moving him out of the way. No matter how hard they try, he's just, he's there, he's planted, he's solid. Or maybe you're a basketball fan, and you can think of I think Shaquille O'Neal, uh, especially. I mean, the guy's seven foot tall, he's, he's broad, he's, he's strong. And he just, if he wants to stand under the basket, he is going to stand under the basket. And there isn't much you're going to be able to do about it. Okay? So, sports analogies over for now. Okay? But that, that's solid, Live a life worthy, live a life that is weighty, live a life that has substance so that when you stand, you are firm. You are firm. No one's going to be pushing you over. People, when they come up against you, should feel it. Not in the violent, sorry, sports analogy, body check kind of, kind of way. But again, just that solid in front of the net kind of way, not to be moved, not being easily pushed off course. So live a life of substance. Live a life worthy. Live this life of substance. And then he goes on to explain more uh, about it. Worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He goes on to say, be completely humble. Verses two, verse 2 he says, be completely humble. So completely, just as it says, all-inclusive. The word is literally all, each, every, just all, okay, everything, completely humble. And literally, this word humble means that your heart is not far off the ground. Your heart is not far off the ground. Lowly, keeping yourself in a low position. And you know what the thing is about being in a low position? It's kind of like when you meet a child, for the first, especially for the first time, but even ongoing. Let's say the child is only this high. If you come in as the adult and stand up close and do this to the child, it's not very good for relating, right? What do you want to do when, when you meet a child? If you're able, if your knees allow it, you get down. You get eye to eye, you get face to face. You bring yourself down. Or for you dog lovers, it's, you know, a dog who wants to, to greet another dog in a friendly way will come down and even kind of go over on its belly. They will humble themselves. That's what it's saying here. Be completely humble. Lower yourself. And the thing is, if we lower ourselves, you know what you can never do? You can never look down on someone when you humble yourself, when you lower yourself. Be completely humble in your relationships uh, with other people. Be completely gentle, goes on to say. This idea of gentle is, is it's a mildness, a mildness of, of disposition, a mildness of spirit, one who is not easily ruffled, okay? So it's not just being quiet and, and, and passive. It's what it's talking about is one who is not going to be thrown off course. Again, just that, that idea of standing firm. In fact, he'll go on, if we read on in chapter 4, he'll, he'll talk about that as we grow in this, we will mature and, and not be easily blown here and there. And it's this idea. We're not going to be ruffled. We're not going to be thrown off because we're solid, because we're firm, because we're planted. So, simple, right? Be completely humble and be completely gentle. Anyone thinking that this is the point where it's kind of like, okay, I might as well just give up here. <laughs> so if that's you, okay, I, will, I give you permission, just glaze over, you know, you don't just kind of just glaze over. You can smile and nod every now and then to think, make me think you're still listening, but you're just, you know, I'm out because I, I, I can't do this. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's difficult. It's simple, but it's so difficult. This, this is why we're talking about the, the Spirit in the midst of this, because it is the presence, the activity, the life of the Spirit in us that makes this begin to be possible. God's living, active presence. Because we're, we're not just talking about being outwardly calm. We're not just talking about being outwardly humble. It's actually talking about a humbleness of heart and a gentleness of spirit that then comes out in the way we live. Because I'll tell you, I can usually, if, I, if I'm in a good space, I can usually do the outward thing okay. But what's going on inside sometimes is telling a different story. So, again, this is, I, I want to convince you of basically your inability to do this, which sounds counterintuitive and sounds counterproductive. But again, friends, what I'm saying is it's really only the presence of the Spirit in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives that begins to make this possible. We need to rely on the Spirit because there's more. Paul goes on in, uh, in uh, verse 2, verse 3. He says, be patient. And, and when I looked at the Greek for this, it's great. It's a compound word, which means far anger. I mean, that doesn't translate very well, but it means, so basically keep anger far from you. Not that you're running away from your emotions, not that you're running away from anger and avoiding it in that sense, but that you, you know it's there, but you're going to keep it over there. And that's your decision to keep it there. Okay? You're not going to let that come in and get the better of you. Be patient. Keep it reined and controlled instead of allowing it to come in and take control of you. Bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another. This idea of bearing, again, it's, it's this idea of being solid. It's standing firm yourself, standing straight and firm, and being there to support others around you. That's the idea of, of bearing with. But then it says one another. Because if we just see the bearing with, sometimes I get the sense of, well, that means I need to be straight and I need to be strong for everyone around me. And okay, good. But never forget the one another. Never forget the one another. Because sometimes I'm strong and, and I'm there for others to lean on me. But other times I need other people to be strong and, and for me to lean on them. And sometimes we're just all leaning on one another, you know, kind of huddling in uh, to the middle, just leaning on one another, bear with one another, and so support and, and uphold one another. And do so in love. And love, agape love, this, this idea of love, it is so quintessentially at the heart of Christian teaching of the teaching of Jesus, of the teaching of Paul. Agape love, self-giving, self-sacrificing love. It's not the love that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. That's wonderful. It's, it's connected, it can be connected, but that's a different feeling. It's not the love that makes me look at uh, my spouse uh, and kind of feel physically drawn to them. That's, we use love in both of those ways, but it's not that. This is love in the sense of self-giving and self-sacrificing for the other person. This is the love that we see primarily in Jesus. This is love that honors the other. And, and more than anything else except for Jesus himself, the grace of God poured out through Jesus, more than almost anything else, this idea of agape, self-giving love, is the heart is the heart of who we are called to be, of who Jesus is himself and who we are called to be as people of the Spirit. It's the thing that Jesus says very clearly is what identifies us as his people. We just sang it. They'll know we are Christians by our agape love. These are the words of Jesus. It goes on. Make every effort... And I'm going to share the Greek word with you here. I think it's important for you to know the Greek word. The Greek word is spudadzo. And the reason it's important to know is that's just a really fun word to say. Spudadzo. Okay? Make every effort. Spudadzo. 
that's, uh, that's candidate for the most fun Greek word I think I've ever come across, budadzo, okay? The root idea here, uh, make every effort, is to not be hasty, or actually not, sorry, not to not be hasty, but to make haste to do something. So it says make every effort. So the idea is this is something that you want to do right away. Something you want to get to, something that you want to get done. It, it's come to also mean to be diligent. You want to hurry to do the good thing. You want to hurry to do the right thing. So if there are any parents in the congregation today and your child is doing a bit of a half-hearted job of something, you just tell them, spadadzo, okay? And they will have, they'll look at you and roll their eyes. They'll have no idea what you're talking about. But you'll know, and it'll be funny. So, and that's, that's the main thing, okay? Make every effort. Be diligent. To do what? To keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this, friends, is the heart of this passage that we're looking at today. It's the heart of this passage. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As the people of the Spirit, right, we experience oneness, we experience wholeness, the wholeness of the Spirit as we live in peace with one another. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond, in this bond, kind of this sense of ligaments, kind of, you know, ligature that, that connects the body together. As we experience this bond of peace, we will know and experience the unity of the Spirit. And it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. When we know the oneness and the unity of the Spirit, we will experience peace. And when we are living in peace with one another, we experience the oneness and the unity of the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of like double dutch, you know? It's like wherever you jump in, you jump in here, you jump in there, just jump in with the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then it ends with almost this sort of benediction of unity in verses 4, 5, and 6. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and through all. He's just been talking about the oneness, the unity of the spirit. So then he talks about there is one God, one spirit, one body, one hope, and so forth. This, again, just this, this sense of, of the unity, the peace, the togetherness the one anotherness of the people of the Spirit because we are one. So there you go. That's, that's what the passage says, and it's simple, isn't it? So simple, and yet so difficult. It's simple in the sense that, you know, I, I know how to play chess. I could teach you how to play chess in five minutes or less. You may not remember everything right away, but I could teach you all of the rules of chess in five minutes or less. But I, I'm terrible at chess. You know, I've, I've never really given time to, to really get to know it because it is such an intricate and intriguing game. It can take years and years, a lifetime to master. I mean, yes, you have these stories now and then of these prodigies who just kind of, you know, whatever. They sort of had their Rain Man thing of, you know, with chess, whatever. But for the rest of us, it's years and years and years to master this incredibly intricate game. And so we read passages like this. And I think what happens often is we read passages like this and we realize, man, I am not a master. You know, that's the first thing. Those aren't the words that we use. We just think like, oh, I, I'm not very good at this. Like, yeah, and the way that, you know, those of us who are still learning the game of chess still aren't very good at chess compared to the master. There is only one master, and that's Jesus. But we are called to be apprentices in the way of Jesus and to become step by step, little by little, a little bit more like him uh, and, and who he calls us to be. Because by his spirit, Jesus can then take us where we are. And you know what? He delights in our learnings. 
He delights in our, our stumbling steps as we try and maybe fall, as we try again and maybe fall, and as we try again, and I could go on and on. But Jesus delights in our attempts. Jesus delights in, in teaching us this game. It's not a game, you know, this life. Life in the Spirit. But he's much less interested in telling us the rules. Yes, there's an aspect of that. He tells us the rules. Hey, here's, kind of, here's what it's supposed to look like. But he's much less interested in focusing on the rules and much more interested in helping us discover the joy. The joy of the life that comes through the Spirit. That's what it's about. To help us enjoy, to help us learn to love this life, this, this life with Jesus. I said we're going to look at Galatians 5 as well, and Paul uses a slightly different, well, slightly uses a completely different analogy here, but one that also helps us understand. So if you have your Bibles open, you can flip over to Galatians uh, chapter 5. Uh, which is just actually flip back to Galatians chapter 5, and we're just going to look at verses 22 and 23, right? So, so in this chapter, Paul here, he's, he's talking about life in the Spirit, life with the Spirit as the people of the Spirit. And he says it's kind of like, in this passage here, it's kind of like fruit growing on a tree, fruit growing on, on a bush. Okay, so Paul has been speaking here of the freedom that comes through life uh, in, in Christ, life in the Spirit. And he contrasts uh, life in the Spirit with life in the flesh. And in making this contrast, understand that he's not saying Spirit good, flesh bad, okay? Mortify your flesh, like, you know, whip yourself, flesh is bad. Like, he's not saying that. The, the, the Hebrew understanding of the flesh actually, I mean, it was made by God, and, and it is good. But here's the thing. If we take the flesh, which was a good gift from God, and all of kind of the natural desires that go along with the flesh, if we allow the flesh to be in the driver's seat, if we allow the flesh to take the reins, he's saying, that's actually going to lead you to a bad place. So the contrast he's making is, who is in the, the driver's seat? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? And he's encouraging us to, to live life in the spirit. Okay? So I just... Verses 13 to 15 uh, help us lead into our, our, our verses today. He says here, But you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another. There's another one another. Serve one another humbly in love, using a lot of the same language. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Okay? So again, just talking about life in the spirit. This is the flesh-spirit contrast. But then he comes to, in verses 22 and 23, he talks about uh, the acts of the flesh. But then he gets into, he talks about the fruit of the spirit. And that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these, against such things, there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit. I was talking a moment ago about the game of chess and how that helps us understand sort of the, the life, life in the Spirit, the rules versus the joy. Well, here he talks about the fruit, right? So fruit, if you think about it, how does fruit grow? I mean, I don't need an intricate scientific answer. I don't know. But can I give you my simple answer? Fruit grows like an apple grows on an apple tree because there is apple DNA in the tree that brings about apples on the tree. That's about as good as I can do. And then there's water and photosynthesis and stuff as well. I don't know. Okay? But apples grow on an apple tree, cherries grow on a cherry tree, raspberries grow on a raspberry bush because there are apple, cherry, and raspberry DNA in the plant. And so it comes out as this fruit. It comes out naturally. It grows because of what's 
there what's inside. So with the fruit of the Spirit, this fruit of the Spirit is to grow naturally out of the DNA of who we are because we are the people of the Spirit. And if we are people of the Spirit, then the things of the Spirit will grow and become apparent and, and will grow out in our lives. But you know what we do? You know what so many of us do as, as, as we try to follow, as, as we try to follow the rules that we read in Scripture? And, and you know what we do? To use this analogy, we go around with, with a mallet and some, some sticks, we pound them into the ground, and then we tie like some apples, we tie some fruit to the sticks. We're try, we try to manufacture. We try to, when we try to follow the rules, all we're doing is we're trying to manufacture this fruit. But fruit arises, fruit grows out of what's within. Now, is it a wrong thing? Is it a bad thing to make a determination? I want to go and do a good thing. and whatever? Like, it's not a wrong thing. It's not a bad thing. But it's not ultimately where we want to end up. It's like when you first start learning chess, you know, all I know is how the pieces move. I have no idea beyond that, so I'm going to move my piece here. I'm going to move my piece there. But I have no idea of how it all goes together. You know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I, I, I'm told I'm supposed to do, okay? But we're losing because we don't know how it all goes together. So we start there, and that's okay. But we grow from there. We grow to the point that as we invite and we experience the Spirit within us, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, these things will arise naturally out of us because the Spirit is within us. Because we are people, persons of the Spirit, and because we are the people of the Spirit. This fruit will grow, as Jesus talks about in John chapter 15. The fruit will grow as we abide in him. Jesus uses a similar analogy. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. But if we're not connected to the source, it's not coming. It's not going to be there. The fruit grows because we are the people of the Spirit. Now, as, as we end today, I want to do something a little differently. So we're talking about chess earlier. So we're talking about how life is kind of like a game. I thought, what, you know what we're going to do? We're going to play a game. We are, seriously. And in a moment, if you, want, if you want to do this on your own, you can do this on your own. But playing a game by yourself is not nearly as fun as playing it with someone else. So I'm going to encourage you with whoever is beside you. You can even turn around to the people behind you. The more you have in your group, the easier the game will be for you. And here's what the game is going to be. I don't know if you ever played this game if you went on car trips uh, when you were a kid or, or with your kids. And there was a game that we sometimes played with our kids, uh, which was, well, I'm going on a trip. I'm going on a journey to wherever. And I'm going to bring with me, and the first person has to say something with the letter A. I'm going to bring with me an apple. Okay. So then the second person says, I'm going on a trip to whatever, and I'm bringing with me an apple, and, and then something that starts with B. Maybe they'll say a banana, because I have fruit on the brain here. Okay. And so then the third person says, I'm going on a trip, and I'm taking with me an apple, a banana, and a cat and so on, A, B, C, and all the way, and see if you can get through the whole alphabet. And you go around, you each take a turn, and you try to remember all of the previous ones, and then you, you add one. So here's the game that you're going to play. If you don't have your Bible open to Galatians 5 already, I would invite everyone to do that. It's on page 1812, just to, to make it quick, uh, if you don't know exactly where to find that. And here's what you're going to do. With the fruit of the Spirit, there are nine fruits of the Spirit, you're going to play this game. Okay, so the first person says, is going to say, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you're going to stop. Then the next person is going to look and see what the, the second word is. The second person is going to say, the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace. Love and joy. Love and, boy, I better look. Anyway, you'll have it open so you know. Love and joy. Thank you. 
Uh, and then the third person, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Until you get all the way through it, and then once everyone's all the way through it, we're going to do it all together. Okay? Simple. It's like, just take a couple of minutes, do that with each other, lots of noise, lots of conversation. If you're sitting on your own, tap someone in front of you, turn around to the people behind you, and just enjoy. Enjoy, enjoy a, sh- a little game. Okay, got it? Got it? Okay, let's see. Here's the test. Here's the test. Close your Bible or at least close it over so you're not looking at it. And say it along with me. And I tend to say, I I have patience in my mind, not forbearance. But this translation says forbearance. So I'll try to remember that as we look at this one. Okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, faithfulness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. All right. Now, after telling you about it's not about the rules, why are we sitting here memorizing a verse? Isn't that just rote memorization? Isn't that just a rule thing? It can be. But the reason we want to get this in our minds is so that when we see it, when we experience it, when we see it, when it happens, you can stop and say, ah, that's what this is. That's what this looks like. That's what this life is all about. That's what it means to be the people of the Spirit. So yeah, we don't need to get caught up. I think memorizing is a good thing, but not in and for itself. It's so that it points us to what is deeper. And that's my prayer, is that it would point us today, tomorrow, this week, and always to what it means, what it looks like to be the people of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. You are good. You are the one who sent Jesus, came to us to be with us in Jesus, who you have poured out the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. And Lord, even now in this moment, I I feel like I'm feeling your presence. I'm sensing your presence here among us. And so just, Holy Spirit, would you just make us deeply aware of who you are. Make us deeply aware of your grace, of your presence, of your your discipline, of your truth. Convict us, Lord, where we need to be convicted. Lord, pick us up and where we are bowed down and burdened with guilt and shame. Lord, may we know your truth and grace fully as it was fully in Jesus. Lord, may the fruit of your spirit become more and more, even in our our faltering, stumbling steps, may they become more and more the substance of our lives as we become people of substance, as we learn to stand, to bear up and with one another to be your people. In the name of Jesus and by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Christ comes preaching the good news of the kingdom and calls us to follow him. Let's sing together hear the call of the kingdom.
Let us pray. Almighty, loving, merciful Father, we confess our unworthiness to you. But thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit is active among us to revive us by the cleansing blood of Jesus. I have to announce that Ann Mapp has passed away. Please pray for the Hopkins family at this time. And we also humbly ask that you help the people of Alberta who have lost loved ones, homes, and farms from the terrible fires. We also ask you to be with the people of Italy who have lost their homes due to flooding. And, oh God, we pray that peace may come to the war-ravaged land of Ukraine. We thank you for your protection from all evil. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Friends, as we go from this place, as we go out back to our families, as we go out to our homes, to our jobs, to our communities, friends, go not feeling that you must act like people of the Spirit, but go knowing that you are people of the Spirit. And just in that, that simple change of I must, I, I must do, I must, to I am a beloved child of God. I am a person of the Spirit. We are the people of the Spirit. Not because I've got it all together, but because He does and He calls. And so friends, go be the people of the Spirit in your own stumbling ways. And Jesus will delight in you. So go knowing the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go knowing the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, not just this day, but forevermore. Friends, go in peace. Amen. So uh, on behalf of the youth group, I uh, heard that you were praying for us as we were away last week, and on behalf of them, I want to thank you for praying for us. We uh, had a wonderful weekend. Um, we had uh, times of worship. We had a campfire where uh, there was marshmallows and sticks stuck in the fire. Um, there was a time, probably my favorite time, and when I tell you why, You'll understand. We took about an hour or so, and we had total silence, which on a retreat is pretty good. Uh, but we had an hour of silence where uh, we kind of went off and kind of spent a moment to focus our thoughts on the world around us and God's voice in our lives. We drew pictures of flowers or trees or things that were striking to us, and Duncan, do you remember what you said when we came back? You said, <laughs> you said I needed that. Uh, and I think that was true for many young people. Uh, the pace of the world is pretty quick, and there's a lot of volume. And so we took an hour, and we were quiet, and we found rest. So I want to thank you for your support of the youth group and for uh, praying for us, because I believe... Uh, God used that time for us, and we're grateful to you. Thank you. I'm going to now dismiss the kids to go to their age-graded ministries. The youth will be downstairs, and Sylvia is at the back to take the younger ones out. There are a few additional announcements. Pentecost, May 28, will be a special day with a baptism and profession of faith at the morning service. The same day, an evening worship service with Liz Honeyford 
and Healing Care Canada, uh, and that will be at 7 p.m., and all are welcome. Pray for Pastor Sean and the other commissioners, clerks, and participants in this year's General Assembly taking place on June the 4th through to June the 7th. Amen. Oh,